Uh, and first, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the singular value decomposition principal component analysis in detail, and then look at the friends of this method in, in some detail. Okay, so first of all, uh, SVD. And here's, again, some of the papers related to this type of thing. And now what I want you to do when we uh, think about this, I want you to kind of have a, again, think about the problem we're thinking about. The data that we're presented with, um, we imagine a data matrix like this. Now this is um, tilted 90 degrees relative to the matrices we've looked at, where we have genes or positions on the genome, whatever, going vertically, and we have different assays. This particular thing is called different arrays. It's just because that this paper was done that I'm presenting to you a while ago, and it the, the assays were gene expression arrays, so they were called arrays, but these are essentially different assays, different features going across, okay? So that's the data matrix that we're interested in. And now what, what this um, approach called um, SVD does is it's going to decompose our data matrix into three matrices. And this decomposition is very powerful. It's, it's a classic bit of mathematics. It's not some new thing that people just recently came up with, but it's a very solid piece of mathematics that's going to um, kind of take apart the matrix that we, we've presented in terms of its both its rows and its columns. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna get three matrices. And one group of, ma of uh, matrices is gonna be constructed of our genes and what's called eigenarrays, which are kind of like, a, or eigenassays or kind of uh, sort of um, eigenvalues associated with the assays. And then another thing is gonna be all of our assays and then what's called eigengenes, uh, which are kind of canonical kind of eigengene representations. And then there's a connector matrix uh, that kind of has the weights of these different things. And this is really the thing that creates this uh, spectral quality to it because the top rank things in this matrix will be uh, larger and then it will kind of fade down. Uh, it's a very powerful technique. So now let's go through this a little in some detail. So here's our A matrix. Uh, and the, um, I think that the key thing to realize is that the, we can, in this transformation, we can take our data matrix and we can always transpose it. To look to, so what's rows in one is columns in another and so forth. And so we talk sometimes about the row space and column space, but they're um, inter, sort of intertwined. We can think of, you know, one situation of having vectors of rows and one situation of having vectors of columns, okay? Um, and then there's a slightly more abstract way to think of this A matrix. You can actually think of it, even though it's a data matrix, we can actually think of it in, in this strange way as, a, as actually a linear transformation that maps a vector um, in the row space of the matrix into the column space. And this will become a little bit clearer in a second. So now let's talk a little bit about that um, U matrix that we get. So um, the um, U matrix, remember, is that we have all our genes um, and then we have these kind of eigenassays. So the column vectors of this are um, orthonormal, okay? And they form a basis um, and they're kind of arranged so that we have the sort of strongest one and then on down to the weak ones. And these um, uh, vectors are actually the eigenvectors of the, um, the similarity matrix A, A transpose. So now if we take our matrix A, let me see how I'm doing for time. Oh, geez. I, if we take our matrix A, I'm gonna go a little bit long on this today uh, and then I'll, so I wanna to get to a nice endpoint. So if we take our matrix A and we um, look at it, the similarity of, of all the, um, columns of the matrix. I think I'm going to write for the columns. We'll do it again for the rows. Um, we'll, we can compute this AA transpose and we can do, we can also compute a transpose A, which is the, the other matrix looking at all, the other similarity matrix looking at all the, the 
columns. And then if we imagine just getting the eigenvectors of this matrix, that's what's in the U matrix, okay? The V matrix is the same thing. It's just the other one around. It's the, the eigenvectors of the A transpose A matrix, okay? Um, and this provides a kind of orthonormal basis for the row space. And essentially what this is, is these are eigengenes that, that give you characteristic patterns of expression over all the different um, assays. And then the S matrix is this diagonal matrix that, like I said, tends to be sorted from largest to smallest. And this actually contains the, I, well, essentially the eigenvalues of the um, A transpose A or A transpose problem. So it's essentially a matrix of eigenvalues. Now, I just want to point out that um, you can rearrange that product to also create the equation AV equals US. So now in this context, it's a little different what's going on. So it looks like A is actually not so much the data anymore. It's operating on the V matrix uh, to give you the U matrix. And that might seem a little counterintuitive, but let's think about what that means. Uh, what that means is that the uh, if you take the A matrix and you operate on one of the um, columns of uh, V, which are the um, like eigengenes and so forth, you will essentially get one of the columns of U, uh, which would be the um, eigen condition. So that that's kind of profound if you think about it for a second. So so A is kind of taking you from the gene space, that's the V, to the um, array space or to the condition space. Okay, and so that that's kind of a neat um, a neat thing, and this will come up in in a bit. Um, it's not completely intuitive, but um, you'll see how cool this is in a second. Now, another aspect of this uh, product, which is kind of cool too, is that we can we can write it this way: A equals U S V T. This is matrix nomenclature, but we can also uh, take the U and write it out in terms of all of its um, eigenvectors and the V in terms of eigenvectors and form these. Um, these are outer products. So uh, if we take the first eigenvector of U uh, times the transpose of the first eigenvector of U, we get a matrix, okay? This isn't an inner product, it's an outer product. And then if we do the second eigenvector, um, second eigenvector, we get another matrix. Now the key point is because these eigen, the singular values and eigenvalues are sorted from biggest to smallest, this is a very nice um, kind of hierarchical decomposition of our original matrix where this is a leading term which captures the most of the variation, a secondary term and so forth. And with, with that, we can actually say, oh, if we don't, we don't wanna use all the terms, we can cut off this series at say R terms and then we can get the best rank R matrix uh, A hat that approximates our A, okay? So we can, we can actually get the, the matrix that kind of minimizes uh, this by kind of cutting off the approximation. This is a very useful uh, way of kind of um, simplifying our data matrix or smoothing it or denoising it. And here's an example of a matrix, a matrices that would be kind of sort of smoothed away. So you can see these are essentially rank one matrices. The columns are very redundant. And the first term in that expansion will pretty much summarize the entire uh, matrix. So this is kind of a nice way of um, removing a lot of the kind of um, small amounts of noise in your data matrix or focusing on the main uh, structure in it. Uh, now we can also see um, this, uh, um, this product, we can think of it as in, in a slightly different way too. We can uh, see it in terms of the first, um, uh, eigenvector V, the U values are as the, the, the U values is kind of the, the projections onto that, uh, to that eigenvector. Okay. Um, so each of the values in U is a projection of A onto this eigen, um, onto this eigenvector. Okay. And which is kind of nice. Um, and then of course, if we discard the rest of the data, we just have the first term here. So this, the first term here basically is, is all in say the V direction and the, the values of U are the projections um, of A onto that, um, that first eigen, 
uh, vector. Um, and then, of course, we can go further. We can look at the uh, the next term, uh, u two v two, and we get a different direction and so forth. Um, um, so, I you know I think the the sort of key thing is this is a little bit unintuitive, but it's a kind of nice um, uh, summary of this uh, uh, the um, the matrices and so forth. So now you, we've been talking about rows and columns. It, it should be obvious to people that this is completely arbitrary. If we just transpose this entire equation, uh, you know, A equals USV transpose, if we transpose the whole thing, we'll essentially flip rows to columns in our data matrix. So what was the rows becomes the columns and so forth. And notice here that that just flips around the um, SVD um, and so forth. So, so obviously, Everything we're saying in relation to rows and columns is completely equivalent if we just um, transpose the matrix. Um, now I'm going to give you a little bit of intuition, a little bit more intuition about the um, uh, the meaning of the uh, rows and columns. So let, let's come back now to um, our original uh, setup where we have the um, columns were the conditions, okay? or the, what's called here arrays in this paper. And the um, the rows were genes, okay? So we have our original data matrix, okay? Now, what we can um, do with our original data matrix is we can actually um, resort this matrix. So now we're gonna sort it so that each, we're gonna sort it in terms of the projection of each gene onto the uh, the top eigengene, okay? And when we do that, you can see we get a really nice um, banding pattern here for the different genes. Now, what does that banding pattern mean? This experiment that I'm showing you, this paper, what this did is it looked at um, the yeast cell cycle. So concretely, what was this? This was 6,000 genes in yeast. And now the, this, going across here, we're looking at time. These are different, um, like I said, these are called arrays, but essentially there is like an RNA-seq experiment at different times, okay? And now what we're sort of seeing by this is that the first eigengene, okay, it was basically genes that kind of come on initially, okay, and then kind of go off. And then you can kind of see uh, the genes kind of sorted in terms of they, they don't project as well as we go down. And these are genes that um, come on at a uh, somewhat later uh, later uh, time. And we can do um, the uh, same thing with um, the arrays. Okay, so we can actually um, look at the, eigen, um, the uh, uh, eigen arrays and we can see that we kind of have characteristic patterns in each of the arrays of genes that come on at say early, late, and then well, it's an oscillating phenomenon, so then they reoccur. So for instance, the first array of the first time represents genes. These are genes that characteristically, well, sorry, I should maybe do the green, the genes that come on uh, initially, and then they go um, they go off. And, and likewise, the second one represents a kind of time shifted um, uh, view of that. Um, now, what we can also do, which is kind of neat, is, and I should say in this paper, they use this uh, very physics-y notation, it was called Brockett notation, for talking about the um, eigengenes, it, j j just the way they're written. Uh, different people have different ways of writing the, the um, eigengenes and eigenrays. So here, what we can do is we can um, take each uh, time point um, here, and we can uh, correlate that uh, time point with the um, first um, eigen um, array and then the second eigen array. Okay, and then the correlations of the two tell us for a given um, time point, right, where which of these eigen uh, 
conditions does it project best on, okay? So we start off, we obviously project, uh, well, in this one, the time one, we project mostly onto this um, eigenarray. And then what happens, which is kind of neat, is if you look at all the different points, and this is in the cell cycle, you can see how they, you know, they start projecting onto one and then they project onto less onto one and more onto the other. And it kind of actually rotates around a circle. So it's really pr quite pretty here. So we can see in terms of the um, projections, uh, how we almost get this kind of cyclical motion of the um, conditions. Uh, and then we can actually, um, if we color each of these uh, conditions uh, by, um, you know, uh, what quadrant they're in, we can also take the genes, okay, and project them on to the um, top two eigen, um, eigen genes, okay, and then we can see that the genes that say mostly um, correlate, uh, say, say they correlate mostly in this quadrant, they tend to be the genes that would or tend to be correspond to the, the genes that go on in this array uh, condition and so forth. So it's a very kind of nice way of looking at this periodic process in terms of these eigenarrays and eigen genes. Okay. 